start recording. And then I'm going to introduce our presenters. So this session is being hosted by Melody Rood, our student success librarian at UNCG. And she's joined by John Schreiner, web services librarian at CUNY. So I'm going to turn it over to Melody and John. Hello, thank you and welcome. So our presentation today is called The Internet Never Forgets, Image-Based Sexual Abuse and the Workplace. So a quick content warning, our presentation is going to involve conversations um, or discussions around sexual abuse and assault. And while we won't be going into any specific cases or details, we recognize that everyone has a different threshold. And if at any point you feel like you want to leave this presentation, by all means, please do. We won't be offended. And if anything, we really encourage you to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. So um, Jenny introduced us, but just a little bit of more like background information about this research. Um, so I'm Melody Rood, student success librarian. Um, and I was kind of interested in doing this research with John, um, sort of from a feminist theory standpoint. Um, my, in undergrad, I majored in women, gender, and sexuality studies. It's kind of just a, uh, one of my major research interests. Um, but also in a lot of the literature that we read, um, we found that IBSA um, affected not only the workplace, but also a lot of educational prospects as well. So there's a student success component to it, um, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my um, sort of how I'm connected to this research. And I will turn it over to um, John Schreiner, who is a former colleague of mine and an old friend. So John, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Um, so hi, nice to meet you all today. Um, this is a really tough topic, but it's an area that's very important. Um, my background is in librarianship as well as digital forensics and cybersecurity. Um, I do a, a lot of dark web research and image-based sexual abuse spans a lot of areas, including criminology, gender studies, ethics, um, communication studies. Um, so we hope that you find this informative. And yeah, it's a really tough topic, but um, it's important. And um, we're very happy to meet with you today. Thank you, John. All right. So um, just a little bit of context about this. So this presentation is sort of based on a chapter that John and I co-wrote for an upcoming handbook on cyber harassment that sort of focuses on the workplace. Um, so just as a side note, the chapter is like, um, it, was, it was a ton of research. Um, it ended up being like 40 pages. Um, so I just bring that up because there's no way that we can really hit every single point that we brought up in the chapter. Um, within this presentation, but we will do our best to try to sum up the main points. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we live in a culture of documentation. Um, it's estimated that 1.2 trillion photos were taken in 2017, and out of those images, 85% were from smartphones. So 1.2 trillion is one of those numbers that's like easy to read, but kind of hard to imagine. Um, and then, you know, take that into mind, but then also take into mind that, you know, there's so many different types of social media platforms now that there's sort of this culture of documentation that exists. We sort of have this desire to capture moments. Um, with that being said, it's not terribly uncommon to post something or share something that you might later regret. You might post something that um, you didn't intend to offend somebody, but it accidentally does offend somebody or you might subtweet something or somebody about somebody. Um, all of these things can happen. In one 2015 survey that we looked at, um, it explored commonly regretted types of social media posts in the United States. And out of 138 respondents, 14% claimed to have shared pictures that they believed could potentially affect their reputation at work. And 10% sent uh, intimate sexual messages with a fear that their privacy could be breached. So this, kinds of lead, this kind of leads us to the topic of this presentation, um, which is image-based sexual abuse. But you've probably heard this referred to as its more common name, revenge pornography. So revenge pornography is uh, sexually explicit images or videos of an individual published online without their consent and with the intent to cause them distress. So, um, Generally, this terminology is avoided in academic and activist literature, 
And for that reason, we are going to be using the term image-based sexual abuse, but we will probably be saying IBSA for brevity's sake. Um, another quick note on terminology, um, if you do hear us say revenge pornography, as it does come up sometimes, um, it's because we are either paraphrasing or directly quoting um, literature that might have used that. For example, when we talk about um, websites that host IBSA, they're usually referred to as revenge pornography websites, so you might hear that. Um, another quick note on terminology, we are going to be using the term victim survivor, so that's victim slash or victim dash survivor. Um, and that was a decision that we made because we wanted to honor the choice of people who want to identify as survivors, but also acknowledge the severity of this crime. So um, again, if you hear just victim or just survivor, it's probably because we're paraphrasing from literature that used one or the other. But in terms of why we won't be using revenge pornography, um, I believe that that is best summed up by this passage. It's kind of a longer passage, which I generally don't like to read out loud during presentations, so I apologize, but I do think that it's important and that not a whole lot could be cut from it. So it says, the term revenge porn is misleading in two respects. First, perpetrators are not always being motivated by vengeance. Many act out of a desire for profit, notoriety, or entertainment, including hackers, purveyors of hidden or quote unquote upskirt camera recordings, and people who distribute stolen cell phone photos. The term revenge porn is also misleading in that it implies that taking a picture of oneself naked or engaged in a sexual act or allowing someone else to take such a picture is pornographic. But creating explicit images in the expectation within the context of a private, intimate relationship, an increasingly common practice, is not equivalent to creating pornography. The act of disclosing a private sexually explicit image to someone other than the intended audience, however, can accurately be described as pornographic, as it transforms a private image into public sexual entertainment. So basically what this passage is saying is that one, IBSA is not always about revenge. And assuming that that's the main reason, it really reduces this very serious, very multi-layered issue into a simple, you know, quote unquote, scorned ex-boyfriend narrative, um, when we know that's not always the case. And two, the act of taking an intimate image with the understanding that it is not for the general public is not the same thing as creating pornography. Because as we know, pornography is an adult entertainment intended for an adult audience with the assumption that those involved have given their consent. So it's not the act of taking the photo that's pornographic, but the act of making a private image public that's actually pornographic. And this is really important when we start to have conversations about victim blaming, which happens um, quite often with IBSA. So victim survivors of IBSA are impacted in so many ways. Um, for one, they have to deal with the, hum the humiliation of having a private image that was not intended for a uh, public audience being circulated around the internet. Um, not only that, their um, personal information is often leaked. And if you can imagine, that means that they are then uh, flooded with deeply disturbing messages from strangers. In addition, one's place of work is usually the first target of online abusers. Sometimes um, these people will send uh, your supervisor or your colleagues the images with like very crude messages. Um, but there have been cases where online abusers, um, they blackmail the victim survivors into meeting them in person or they'll leak the images, which you can imagine is a very terrifying situation to be put into. So the major issue here is that even if a single person uploads the image online, it's usually shared anonymously so often that it becomes nearly impossible to find all the perpetrators or all of the corners that it has gone to on the internet, um, which means it's harder to take those things down. So the question is, why would people do this? So there's kind of a multitude of larger cultural issues at play here that we could spend all day talking about. Um, but why would somebody, you know, eat, even if they weren't the original poster, why would they then, you know, come across the image and choose to share it or choose to go out of their way to find out information about this person to leak their personal information so that person could experience even more abuse? Why would somebody do that? Well, this sort of cyber mom mentality is usually associated with this term online disinhibition. 
So disinhibition, or what social psychologists more broadly call de-individuation, is this phenomenon where um, basically you lose your self-awareness in a crowd. So if you put it in an online context, um, online disinhibition is associated with uh, anonymity in a forum or collective identity. So online disinhibition can be benign or it can be toxic. So benign online uh, disinhibition is the ease of communicating online versus in person. So you can think of this as an example of somebody who might have social anxiety, um, who uh, finds that talking to people online using a pseudonym um, makes it easier for them to open up and they might be able to find a community that relates to their identity or something like that. That's an example of benign online disinhibition. Toxic online disinhibition is the ease of hurting somebody due to a perceived anonymity. So this is the idea that because you are anonymous, um, you can't be held accountable. Um, so examples of this would be trolling, edgelord culture in general. Um, for those of you who don't know it, that's, that's basically shock effect culture. Um, and then obviously cyberbullying plays into this as well. So toxic online disinhibition can lead to less concern about social norms and generally the well-being of others. Uh, this is exasperated by the idea that uh, the internet is somehow separated from reality. So the combination of these things can lead people to do things that they normally wouldn't do if they were identifiable. And this is not to excuse anyone's behavior as if like, you know, oh, they're just doing this because of this like social phenomenon. Um, it's just one way that social psychologists are exploring this type of behavior. So another thing that has to be addressed when talking about IBSA is the problem of victim blaming. So victim blaming is the act of shifting the perspective or narrative of a situation to insinuate or clearly declare that a crime was committed due to the actions or behaviors of the victim survivor. Victim blaming is something that is very familiar within the women's rights movement. Everyone has probably seen or heard a case where you know, a domestic abuse victim survivor uh, is being blamed for the actions because you know, they should have just left the person that was hurting them um, or that you know, a woman was sexually assaulted because she was intoxicated or quote unquote wearing the wrong outfit. Well, the same sort of um, arguments are now uh, happening with cases of IBSA. And given that 90% of revenge pornography victims are women, according to the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, we can't ignore the fact that this is a gendered issue. Another way that um, victim survivors are being blamed is through uh, sort of this rhetoric of risk management. So online risk management is kind of uh, weighing potential risks related to your online presence and then avoiding those situations. It's definitely a good practice and it's important. It's why some people have, you know, like personal social media accounts versus professional social media accounts. Um, but oftentimes it's used as a tactic to blame victim survivors. So for example, you know, if you didn't want your boss to see this, then you shouldn't have sent this to your partner. In terms of academic research, we found decades of research in this area that sort of span from criminology, com communication studies, law, ethics, gender studies. Uh, it's clearly multidisciplinary, as John mentioned earlier. Um, but these are some important concepts that we explored in the chapter, some of the main ones. So the first one is Liz Kelly's 1988 Continuum of Sexual Violence. And basically, this was um, um, a framework that was formulated to put sexual crimes on a continuum. And then McGlynn and colleagues uh, added to this by adding IBSA onto that continuum, noting that Kelly developed the concept in a way uh, that could be intersectional and expanding. And then um, Powell and Henry noted that IBSA is a technosocial issue in that it replicates sex, gender, and power that already pre-existed before the technology. So what that means basically is that the issues around sex, gender, and power, as we know, um, existed way before the internet and this technology. But now that we have this techno-social world, we're seeing that it's mirroring some of those same issues. So now we're going to talk about some of the challenges and how it affects the workplace. And for this, I'm going to turn it over to John now. Sure, I'm gonna to speak to some of the challenges to um, victim survivors seeking justice, seeking redress. Um, next, please. Um, so uh, websites and section 230 of the Communications Decency Act from 1996. Um, this is a, a, an important 
part of this. Um, so, uh, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So, that's a mouthful. Um, what it's saying is that uh, Section 230, the second bullet, uh, says that it allows these providers to avoid accountability because they are just the channel whereas the content is user, user submitted. So third parties submit the content and the, the host, the, um, the service provider, the website can't be held accountable, right? Um, this is how revenge pornography websites sort of get around this. Um, they, they are encouraging and hosting IBSA, but because they are the, the channel, they're not held accountable. So um, it's basically safe harbor protections, right? It's also a loophole for IBSA. So, um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, which I know everybody probably here loves, um, and I love them too, they uh, effectively helped to find portions of the CDA unconstitutional, which is great, but they are really supportive of Section 230, right? Because it's nuanced, um, the, whole, the whole situation is nuanced. We're trying to strike a balance between free speech protections and open internet and sites that actively solicit IBSA, right? So um, you, can, you can sort of, see where, where they're coming from, right? We don't want people to upload stuff and have the serv service provider held accountable, right? For like, you know, say I uploaded a uh, copyrighted material, whatever. Um, yeah, so it, it's nuanced. Um, so some sites uh, include full names, professions, and cities of residence. Victim survivors have filed lawsuits based on the loss of educational and employment opportunities. Next, please. So monetization is a large problem as it creates the incentive to run these kinds of sites. Um, IBSA website providers make money through advertisement, redirecting to pornography sites or content removal fees, sometimes upwards of $400. So this is the, the person whose image um, is on the site, they want to have it removed, they have to pay money to have it removed. So um, one owner boasted his site reached $30,000 a month. He said, he said, quote, why should I care? It's not my life. It's lit literally just a business. It's stupid not to monetize it. That's Hunter Moore. Um, so not surprising that these website operators are terrible people, right? Um, so yeah, it's just one in, uh, in the case of many. So um, yeah, so uh, federal court rulings are shutting down these sites without immunity and even sentencing owners to prison, but images have most likely moved to hundreds of other sites and the damage is irreversible. So the takedowns are due to other crimes like extortion or hacking rather than hosting, you know, the life destroying IBSA. Um, Kevin Bollart, another site operator is serving 18 years for six counts of extortion and 21 counts of identity theft. These are probably like iCloud hacks and stuff like that. Um, okay, next please. Um, so, from the clear net to the dark web. I just wanted to find the clear net. Um, it's a term we often use, um, we don't often use, but it's pretty useful. So it's, it's just, the clear net is the open web, normal websites that you get to using Firefox or Chrome, um, no specialized software. Um, the dark web itself is, uh, has its server locations and service hosts hidden from both law enforcement and from site operators. So um, Tor, I2P and Freenet, these are three popular anonymity networks that make hidden services possible. Um, just to briefly explain how Tor works, if you're not oh, um, aware, um, when you use Tor browser, you request a hidden site and your connection is bounced three times around the globe, ostensibly, to meet the website at a rendezvous point after it is bounced three times. So it's sort of complicated, but each node of the circuit only knows where the request came from and the next stop but it never knows the full picture. So I request a site, the site doesn't know where that request came from. Um, and I don't know where that site is located. So uh, the technology is of course, like a lot of other technologies. Um, Tor allows users to access Facebook or Twitter in countries where it's blocked, but then there's other terrible uses like illicit dark websites like um, that host this kind of material, right? Okay, um, well, this is just a screenshot from the internet archive of, um, Hunter Moore launching a new revenge pornography site and noting that, quote, we are going to start off by launching with all the old is any, anybody up content 
and all new content. And so um, that's the problem, right? Even with takedowns, the archived content lives on and gets passed on. Next, please. So um, lack of training for law enforcement. We found a lot of case studies about this, right? So police often lack the training, technical training to understand cyber threats. Um, worse, they don't take the claim seriously, indicating a lack of sensitivity training and misunderstanding the severity of the crime. Um, lack of understanding the few laws that actually protect a victim survivor, such as copyright laws, right? Um, for example, if I take a photo and show my partner, the copyright is not given to them. I still hold the copyright. Some plaintiffs have tried this method to have their images removed. Um, lastly, victim blaming is common when victim survivors seek help from law enforcement, often being told that it's their fault. So next we'll discuss IBSA in the workplace. Um, so there are no legal protections for victim survivors in the U.S. to be safeguarded when seeking educational opportunities or employment. Pursuing legal action is expensive and often cannot guarantee anonymity. Um, and you're possibly setting yourself up for more abuse, right, if your name is out there. Um, behavioral ec economists suggest that information from online searches is often used as a proxy for reliability. That is to say, employers often look a candidate up during the hiring process. And um, the large search engines like George, uh, Google and Bing have made strides in addressing these concerns with tools for like delisting sites, uh, but many photos still, you know, live out there. Next. Um, so lack of workplace policies around cyber harassment. Many workplace cultures underestimate the severity of cyber harassment. So similar to law enforcement, right? Um, policy is often slow to adapt to different technologies. So even if policy checks, uh, catches up, is it sufficiently broad to cover new abuses like deep fakes and sexualized photoshops? Something we're gonna be hearing more about in the near future, right? Um, so in situations where much of the work is done online, there are little to no protections to new economy sectors, especially for women, for example, game design. And there is a need for workplace protections, even if the workplace is online. Um, so tar uh, sorry, targets livelihood and financial security. Um, so we found co countless cases where IBSA victim survivors suffered mental health issues from the abuse. Um, IBSA is often coupled with doxing, that is providing personal details like one's home address. So this, this leads to concerns about physical safety due to violent threats, right? Concerns about colleague perceptions and professional reputation, internal and external victim blaming. Um, as far as financial security, we have content removal fees, legal fees, name change fees even. Um, even getting the images removed can be po impossible and up to the whim of the site operator, or you could have to pay this giant content removal fee, right? Um, so job security, as you mentioned, the first target of revenge porn campaigns is often the victim's workplace. Uh, we have promotion or other employment opportunities are affected and even having to relocate. Okay. To you, Melanie. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, so um, obviously a lot of issues there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about solutions and recommendations um, based on the literature that we read. However, um, it's worth noting that, um, you know, there are deeply rooted issues here that play into this like general violence against women. Um, and that sort of makes solutions and recommendations a little difficult and complicated. Um, but uh, the literature uh, definitely suggests um, that there needs to be a lot of cultural shifts. So one of the main things that they talk about is this sort of shift in the way that we view um, the internet as sort of this wild west, um, sort of wild west culture. Um, so basically that means that nobody should be surprised by what's said on the internet because anything goes, right? So that includes name calling, that includes disturbing sexual comments and even death threats. Um, there was one uh, tech blogger, a woman named Laura LeMay. She stated that, you know, constant harassment was so common and so obvious for her that it wasn't even worth mentioning. 
Um, it had gone on for so long and she'd gotten so used to it that it didn't even occur to her um, that it was anything other than what it means to be a woman online. Um, so maybe this isn't normal and maybe it shouldn't be. Unfortunately, conversations that question this are usually met with really strong defenses for freedom of speech. However, what we're talking about here and what we're suggesting is not censorship. We are, um, what we're uh, suggesting is that um, we need to shift culture to stop viewing the online world as a space that is somehow separated from reality and has separate consequences. You know, we are connected to the internet more now than we ever have been, especially right now during COVID-19, since we're all working online. Um, you know, sort of what the norms were 20 years ago should not be what the norms are now. So what we're suggesting isn't extra security or monitoring, but a change in how we socially deal with cyber harassment. Um, that is to say, if every situation is met with, well, that's just how the internet goes, then nothing changes. Furthermore, um, even if anonymous, death threats online should be treated with the same type of urgency um, as an in-person threat by an identifiable individual. So the second thing is that service providers need to be held accountable by the law and through social pressure. However, social pressure sometimes doesn't work. Um, you know, it, it might work in that, you know, if, if it's generally frowned upon to create uh, websites that hold IBSA content, then maybe people won't do it. But there's always a situation where there's a net negative outcome, like the situation with Hunter Moore that John mentioned earlier. The New Yorker called him the most hated man on the internet, and that kind of only seemed to fuel his fire more. So there's always going to be people like him. So we really can't rely on just social consequences to prevent people from opening these websites. There needs to be laws that back that up um, so that they can't escape, you know, narrowly through the Com Communications Decency Act. Another thing that needs to change is the reality of sexting frequency um, conflicting with the discourse around online risk management. We need to change our cultural attitudes about sexting. Um, and sexting is just sending text messages that are sexual in nature. So the truth is sexting happens. There's a really great quote from the Huffington Post that says, telling us not to do it is like preaching abstinence to teenagers. It's grossly unrealistic and it doesn't work. It is also beyond outdated and is just plain ignorant to how modern dating works. Again, we're not saying that you shouldn't practice online risk management um, because it's really important, but telling people not to sext isn't going to get them to stop. So clearly the conversations around that need to shift. And then finally, um, there needs to be a better cultural understanding of how consent is contextual. And again, I have sort of a semi-long quote here that um, I feel like sums this up well, so I'm just gonna read that real quick, but it says, what individuals share with lovers is not equivalent to what they would share with the world. Common sense teaches us that con consent is contextual. Consent does not operate as an on-off switch. The non-consensual sharing of an individual's nude photo should be no different. Consent within a trusted relationship does not equal consent outside of that relationship. We should no more blame individuals for trusting a loved one with intimate images than we blame someone for trusting a financial advisor, support group, or waiter not to share sensitive personal information with others. Consent's contextual nature is a staple of information privacy law. Best practices and privacy laws make clear that permitting an entity to use personal information in one context does not confer consent to use it in another without the person's explicit permission. So just to reiterate this example, whenever you go to a restaurant and you hand your credit card to your waiter at the end of the, your meal, you then don't say, you know, uh, by the way, don't write my, my credit card number down. Don't take a photo of my credit card. Don't share it with anybody. Uh, please sign this paper that's saying you won't do it. Uh, it's just understood that they won't. That is an example of contextual consent. So we do understand this in some cases. It's just that it needs to be um, more wi uh, widely understood uh, in cases of um, intimate images being shared. In terms of privacy and other protections um, that are uh, that have recommended changes is one that is that we should allow victim survivors to use pseudonyms as protective measures when they seek justice, if they do decide to seek justice. So this basically ensures that they won't have to worry about a public trial affecting their job 
um, education or employment prospects. Um, also, there's just plenty of examples that we've read where individuals who've turned to the law just experienced even more online abuse because the idea is that it, that individual wasn't able to, you know, quote unquote, handle the heat. Again, tying it into this idea that the internet is the wild west and retaliating against it will have consequences. Um, another thing that needs to change is that we need to create laws that allow protections to safeguard candidates for education or employment opportunities. So basically what this means is victim survivors should be given the opportunity to explain their situations if a name search does bring up some non-consensual images or um, other things that might affect whether somebody um, makes a hiring decision or an admissions decision. In terms of increased education and training, um, John spoke of this a little bit before, but police should be regularly trained as online sexual abuse becomes increasingly more common. Um, again, they need to understand the uh, few laws that can protect victim survivors, like the copyright law. Um, you know, there was one case that we read where uh, one police officer told a woman that since she gave the image to her then boyfriend, uh, it was his property and he could do whatever he wanted with it. And that's not really how copyright laws work. Um, also, understanding the severity of the problem. We talked a little bit about sensitivity, but also symp sympathy training, um, because a lot of these cases usually end with the police um, blaming the person for, you know, well, why would you send somebody an image if you didn't want everyone to see it? Um, another thing that needs uh, to probably change is how we uh, talk to children about um, these issues. So parents in schools can also help with this. Conversations about how to be a good digital citizenship should, or a di digital citizen uh, should happen early. Um, also, it's really important to understand that toxic online disinhibition um, and cyber harassment in general is something that usually happens in numbers and it's not just a few quote unquote bad apples. So in a lot of cases that we read where, you know, in cases of cyberbullying, not necessarily IBSA, but cyberbullying in general, when uh, somebody gets caught, they're usually, you know, their response is usually that they're crying, they feel remorseful, they, you know, they claim that they didn't understand um, what the consequences of that would be. Um, and this is just to point out that, you know, toxic online disinhibition causes people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. Um, so it might not just be, you know, the quote unquote bad kids who might contribute to this. It's usually a group effort with very devastating effects. And then the workplace, given that so many perpetrators first line of attack is to attempt to get somebody fired or make them unemployable. It makes sense that workplaces develop a strategic plan with clear steps and policies about how to handle IBSA. Um, so, um, Another thing with that is that like education and training should adapt with that. So if you're already doing sexual harassment training, maybe include um, update it to include, um, you know, any attempt to encourage or spread IBSA will be met with consequences. Um, and then also it would probably be wise to have an expert come in and speak on the subject just because uh, you can't ignore the fact that there's probably um, a chance that management doesn't take it seriously, therefore they sort of begrudgingly make their colleagues do this training. Um, and that sets a tone. And that tone is that, you know, something like this is an obligation uh, and not something that uh, the company really cares about. And then finally, there needs to be updated laws. So uh, one of the big things that came up over and over again is that IBSA should be treated as a civil rights issue. And the reason why this is, is because many victim survivors of IBSA often have to go into internet exile. And basically what that means is that they remove themselves from having an online presence, which, you know, at first might not sound like a big deal, but that affects their basic human rights to freedom of expression on and offline. Um, it's a huge deal. Think about if you couldn't be online at a time like this. So, uh, you know, the internet is how we connect. It's how we find job opportunities. It's how we express ourselves. It's how we find communities. And restricting somebody from that um, definitely affects their human rights. Um, 
Also, stalking laws should cover any means, methods, or technologies exploited, emphasis on the technologies exploited to stalk and harass victims. And it should be written in a way where uh, it's understood that um, that includes changing technologies. So uh, we can't really predict what the future holds in terms of technology, but whatever it takes to, um, to hold people accountable for stalking should be written into those laws. And then swift and harsher punishments um, should happen for IBSA service providers and submitters. Uh, because as we talked about, oftentimes these images um, are spread around the internet so often they get moved to the dark web, it's nearly impossible to erase it. Um, so the damage is irreversible, not to mention the mental effects it has on an individual, the financial, you know, the fear of their like physical safety. There's so many uh, ways that people are impacted by this, um, that there should be laws that are written to punish people who contribute to this. And then uh, finally, sort of emphasizing that contextual consent again, that really needs to be written into laws. It needs to be uh, very clearly stated. And the laws also need to avoid using language that is ambiguous, um, which is one way that we've seen um, where crimes often slip through loopholes because of vague terminology. So that needs to be updated so those things can't happen. So <laughs> the issue with all of this is that it could make us feel very powerless. Um, a lot of these recommendations are things that we can't easily put into place because they require major cultural shifts. Um, they require uh, major shifts in updates in the law. That's not something that happens overnight. So it might make us feel powerless. So what are things, some tangible things that we can actually do? Well, these are some ways that you can help. One is that you can believe victim survivors. Um, this goes for all cases of sexual abuse and assault, not just IBSA, but it's really important to believe people if they um, are, uh, being brave enough to open up to you about it. Um, another thing is if you know sensitive images of a colleague, classmate, or a friend is being circulated, don't look at it. Even if you planned on deleting it, even if you planned on not sharing it, um, it's something that seems like it shouldn't have to be said. But um, in some situations, you might think that it's harmless to open it and um, you know, with a, knowing that you're just going to delete it, but don't because the images weren't intended for you. Um, and so it's still um, a breach of that person's privacy and you shouldn't do it. Um, also, this is one of those things that could be written into workplace sexual harassment um, um, policies. You know, if, if uh, the workplace is made aware that something is circulating around and then somebody um, having that knowledge opened an email anyway to view the image, that person could be um, in an HR situation where they are, uh, they could be um, accused of sexual harassment. That's one of the suggestions that were made, um, having known that information. Um, another thing is if you are asked to delete sensitive images that were once given to you, then you should really honor that and delete them even if it's from uh, an ex that you're not in good terms with, on good terms with, if they contact you and say, hey, you know, when we were dating, um, I sent you these images, um, I would like for you to delete them, then just honor that and delete them. And then uh, the last thing, and this is really important, find out how you can help victim survivors before taking action. Because like we mentioned, a lot of times when victim survivors seek help, um, they experience even more online abuse as a retaliation. Um, so you could, even though your intentions might be good, you could be making their situation worse. So don't assume they want you to report to HR. Or don't assume they want you to go to the cops. Really find out what they need first. So that is it for our presentation. I know this is a lot of information on a really challenging topic, um, but we welcome any questions or comments now. So I haven't seen anything come through the chat while y'all were presenting, but if people have questions or comments, please feel free to put those in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, if you want to ask your question verbally.
or even if you want to contact us later, that's fine too. This is a lot of information to absorb, you know. So yeah, um, here's some sources. Um, it, please feel free to look through the slides and read more if you want. What is the age group that this problem exists in? Um, am I unmuted? Yes, I am unmuted. Sorry, I was just double checking. I think it affects everybody. I mean, I imagine that um, people who generally are more tech savvy, um, which I'm not trying to make any assumptions, but uh, you know, younger people might be affected more by it. Um, I think it just depends. I do think that some schools are making like, like sort of strides in really warning people about sending images because honestly, if you get caught with an image, if you're underage, um, you could be charged with um, child pornography. Um, so that's like one way people sort of are uh, trying to encourage younger folks under the age of 18 not to send intimate images, but we know that it does happen. Um, John, do you remember reading anything about specific age groups? Um, not so much. I know, I mean, we, we know that sexting is increasingly more, um, is considered more and more a, a normal part of a healthy relationship. So I think a lot of, like, a lot of this is probably, you know, anybody that sexts a lot is, could be considered a, um, a, a group that could be held, you know, that's vulnerable to this sort of abuse. So, you know, 20s, 30s. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then it says, I've heard cases with middle school girls sending pictures to boys. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you know, it's not that like, I mean, I imagine middle school children are sort of exploring sexuality in general. Um, it's sort of a time when they are, but now they have the addition of the technology that can sort of add to that. So it's, it's challenging because like, I'm sure, you know, like even if like you have children and you talk to your kids about it, I'm sure their friends are probably doing it, you know? So it's something hard to control, but at the very least, if we know it's happening, we can at least try to educate them that like sharing those in images with other people's can like, you can be charged with that. You can be criminally charged with that as uh, sharing child pornography. Right, and, and we found that um, a, a lot of the, uh, I'm sorry, um, a lot of people believe, a lot of people have self-reported that they believe that sharing intimate images is wrong, but a high percentage of people that uh, also have said that they share these images. So we're at this like really, really difficult time where sexting is a, sort of a normal part of a relationship, but also how do you safeguard your future? against, you know, this sort of, this sort of abuse. All right, we've got a comment from Charlie. I was thinking about the laws regarding opening postal mail that's not addressed to you. We might think it's super easy to rip open a paper letter and even easier to click an email, but there are laws in place with punishment for tampering with letters, partly because of the legal entity behind it. I wonder, one, how many years mail was delivered before it became law and two, if private email companies like Gmail does both might dilute or create more delays in getting real laws in place for this. Yeah, it's a good point to make. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like so quick and easy to um, just open somebody else's mail, even if it's someone in your family, but there's laws against it. Um, but like how many times did that have to happen before there was laws? Um, and you know, the same thing could maybe be applied here. How many times does this have to happen before we finally get some laws in place that um, protect people? Any thoughts on that, John? No, you said it great. Um, the, next, the next question was, um, we were wondering how this affects people involved in sex work where the victim may have even more barriers proving consent. Yeah, that's the, the thing, the big thing that we found through our research is that there's not enough research yet. And it's even, you know, some of the frameworks that we talked about were, st were from like 2017 and um, we're still at the very beginning of research, especially um, involving uh, communities that uh, don't have support, you know, like, like sex workers um, or, you know, or have more barriers to um, redress, yeah. 
That's a good point. Yeah, I think also, you know, there's, there's such stigma in this culture in general with sex work that um, somebody who is a victim of this um, probably will not be taken seriously if they seek legal help because people don't take their work seriously in general. Um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's not comparable, but also there are cases where like um, women who, whose husband filmed them without their consent and shared them with their friends um, went to the police and a lot of times law enforcement was just like, well, that's his right, um, which is clearly um, very messed up. Um, so uh, yeah, there, it's, it kind of ties into what we're talking about. There's like general larger issues here with like general violence against women and respect for women that's, that's at play here. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Sarah. Just wanted to thank everybody for coming out today for this. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much to both um, Melody and John. This is really interesting. I've, I'm thinking a lot about some of the copyright stuff that you discussed. Um, and wanting to explore that a little bit more, like if a person takes an image without someone's knowledge, do they, do they still, do they still own the copyright to that, even when the subject of the image isn't consented? I don't know. There's so many questions. Yeah, I think in that case, they can't use the copyright law. I think it's in cases of like them taking a selfie and sharing yeah. it. Yeah. They're then the owner of that selfie. Um, by default. All right, y'all. Well, I did put, and I will put in one more time, the uh, link to the feedback form. If you could fill that out, it would be super appreciated. Um, I want to thank Melody and John one more time, and I want to also thank all of our participants. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and uh, please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, I think for, for people who have questions about this presentation, probably the easiest is to email Melody and she can uh, bring John into the conversation. So thank you everyone. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.